The longest serving Republican in the U.S. House of Representatives died a little more than two weeks ago. And now more than 50 candidates are running to fill the seat of the late Congressman Don Young of Alaska. One of those 50 is a familiar face, former half-term governor and failed vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin. Last night, she perhaps unsurprisingly got Donald Trump's complete and total endorsement, and it feels like the Republican Party has come full circle here. And back in 2008, when the John McCain campaign was scrambling to find a running mate, the team landed on Sarah Palin. The little known, even by the campaign, first term governor of Alaska was a huge hit at first, until she became more known. We all discovered Palin was a candidate, well, seemingly entirely disinterested in the realities of governing. She lacked basic knowledge about foreign policy or even how Washington functioned. But she made up for it with right-wing populist rhetoric and a willingness to take an overtly racist tone towards then-candidate Barack Obama. The Republican base loved it, even when Palin had moments like this one with Katie Couric. When it comes to establishing your worldview, I was curious, what newspapers and magazines did you regularly read before you were tapped for this to stay informed and to understand the I've world. read most of them, again, with a great appreciation for the press, for the media. But like, what I mean, specifically, I'm curious that you... Um, all of them, any of them that um, have, have been in front of me over all these years. As my next guest notes, the fact that Palin was obviously unfit for office was kind of why the base liked her so much. She made the right people angry. She started to draw larger crowds of McCain himself in rallies that looked a lot like the ones Trump would hold eight years later. After losing in 08, Palin resigned as Alaska's governor before her term was up. Not to run for president in 2012, as many speculated, but to focus full-time on posting on social media and a reality show, which she used to reach her base outside of traditional news outlets, a tactic that would help Donald Trump win the presidency in 2016. Now, the Palin model failed as it was, a proud lack of political knowledge mixed with attention-grabbing antics, also set the mold for today's Republican troll caucus, the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene, Madison Cawthorn, Lauren Boebert, and Ted Cruz. And now, 15 years later, after creating the genre, Palin is back trying to make a run to join them. She's already started the audition process. We need people who have cojones. We need people like Donald Trump, who has no, nothing to lose, like me. We got nothing to lose. And no more of this vanilla, milk toast, namby pamby, wussy pussy stuff that's been going on. Jeremy Peters, a reporter for New York Times who traces the link between Sarah Palin in 2008 and Donald Trump in 2016 in his new book, Insurgency, How Republicans Lost Their Party and Got Everything They Ever Wanted. And there are a lot of similarities and really a straight line from Palin uh, to Trump. You do wonder, though, like it's one of these can you go home again kind of moments, whether the 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 shifting the politics in the direction of Trump and, and sort of Matt Gates, Lauren Boebert figures means it's easier for her and, and whether this is sort of a natural fit or maybe uh, it, it's hard to pull off. Well, that was kind of the thing I wondered when I was reporting this book is like, was Sarah Palin the canary in the coal mine or was she kind of an anomaly? And it turns out she's not an anomaly. Sarah Palin is the Republican Party. And I think that you don't need to go very far back into Republican Party history to understand why she clicks with voters. She has always been somebody who has been seen as one of you, right? When she was in Alaska, she clicked with voters because people saw themselves in her. She was a mom, she had five kids, she was, she talked like them, she didn't have uh, like a lot of elitist airs about her. And really that's what Republican voters saw in Donald Trump eventually. I think that what happened to her is another story when, you know, as she became the, the 20, 2008 Republican vice pres presidential nominee, um, she kind of lost her way a bit, but she's now back on the stage. And I think that she's somebody who needs to be taken very seriously well, as a contender for this congressional seat. But there's, I mean, there's, there's some distinctions there, right? So like, what's interesting about her is that she is, you know, she was not, um, she wasn't faking it, right? As, as governor of Alaska, like she was from where she was 
from. She had sort of worked her way through, like, first running for local office. I mean, Donald Trump was like a multi, multi, multi millionaire who, like, never set, set foot outside New York, right? So what's interesting is, like, Sarah Palin and Donald Trump were sort of tapping into the same thing. But it wasn't just, like, you can't chalk it up to, like, lack of pretension or folksiness, particularly now as she's sitting there giving that interview in a house whose sitting room is, like, larger than the, the, the block I live on in Brooklyn. <laughs> like, and, and I think, it, you know, you, 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 you document this here, right? That there's something going on here. Journalists covering Palin's rallies kept documenting the vitriol that was erupting from her crowds. Some of it so ugly, the Secret Service had to look into one incident as a precaution. Reports documented people shouting, Os Obama bin Laden, treason off with his head. Now we've got, you know, the, the sort of ritual two-minute hate that happens at the Trump rallies where they all jeer the CNN. Like, hating the right people and being hated by the right people seems to be the defining thing she tapped into that has become so definitional for a lot of the Republican Party. That's exactly right, Chris. And that was always her appeal in Alaska. At, uh, far back as 2004, when she was uh, uh, not quite governor yet and not a, a major figure, she clicked with people because somebody called her and her uh, fellow denizens of the Wasilla Valley Valley trash, hmm. right? It was a, it was an early version of the deplorables, mm -hmm. and she wore that as a badge of honor, not as 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 something that like, oh, how, how dare you say this about me? They appropriated it, and they took this as a badge of honor, and it worked for them just like it did with Trump supporters because they felt as if the mainstream Republican Party was looking down on them and not representing right. them. And that's what ultimately Trumpism is, right? Trumpism is not an ideology. There, there are no fixed set of policies. It is about making people believe that a set of elites look down on them. It's very populist, as you know, and that is what she ultimately tapped into and has been very good ever since then at perpetuating.